Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lorcan Allen. I'm a 2017 Nuffield Scholar from Moat in County Westmead. I come from a suckler beef farm and I work as an agribusiness specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal. Uh, just to start, I want to just uh, take this opportunity to thank my sponsors for allowing me the opportunity to undertake a Nuffield scholarship over the last two years. I can truly say it's been a life-changing uh, experience in, in more ways than you know. Um, the title of my Nuffield study is A Licence to Farm, How Irish Agriculture Can Maintain Its Social Licence to Operate. And I suppose to start, well, what is a social licence? The social licence really is an unwritten contract uh, between the general public or society and a business or an industry. So in the case of farmers, it's that contract between the general public and the farmer that allows you to do what you do uh, for a living. And the reason I chose this topic is because over the last two years, as I've travelled the world, I've noticed again and again a breakdown in the social licence between farmers and the general public in a number of countries. I've noticed this in New Zealand, where environmental issues, particularly around water quality, had a major impact on the social licence for farmers. Also, animal welfare issues in terms of the treatment of bobby calves in New Zealand dairy farms. I noticed this in the Netherlands, where most consumers today are 20, 15 to 20 generations removed from the farm gate. Again, animal welfare issues is a major issue uh, in the Netherlands, particularly on more intensive farms such as pigs and poultry. Uh, and also, as Niall outlined, the phosphates issue in terms, since the expansion of uh, Dutch dairying since the end of quotas. I noticed this in the UK, where the glyphosate debate continues to rumble on. And again, animal welfare issues in the United Kingdom in terms of uh, the management of dairy calves on farm, badger culling in certain TB-infected areas, and also the total ban on uh, live exports uh, from, from, the, uh, from parts of England. I noticed this in Brazil, where deforestation of the Amazon rainforest was leading to a backlash from urban consumers uh, against farmers clearing land for, for expansion. And I noticed this in the USA, in the Central Valley in California, where almond farmers were being blamed for a five-year drought that hit the state. And really, for me, what all these, uh, this breakdown of social license in all of these countries boils down to its three core issues. It boils down to animal welfare, it boils down to the environmental impact of farming, and it boils down to climate change. And as well, if we take a step back and we look at all those countries I've just mentioned, what did they have, all have in common? Well, they're all global leaders in terms of agriculture that we would see today as an agri-food industry in Ireland. Uh, and all of them have a proud heritage in terms of farming. So this got me thinking, could this happen in Ireland? So this is my objective, to try and figure out, could the social license break down in Ireland? So I started by trying to assess, well, how healthy is the relationship between farmers and society in Ireland today? And if you take this picture, the selfie competition, uh, the farmer selfie, one of the most viral things we've seen uh, over recent years on the internet. Also, you look at Big Week on the Farm, one of the most watched TV programs on RTE, and the record uh, attendances that have uh, flocked to the ploughing over the last number of years, suggests to me that the social license in Ireland is actually in quite a healthy place. However, it's really important that we know there are risks. Under the Food, Food Harvest 2020 programme, and then the subsequent FoodWise 2025 programme, we've seen a significant uh, expansion in primary production in this country. But with that expansion brings risks in terms of higher environmental risk, in terms of higher animal welfare risk, and in terms of climate change risks, because we're not meeting our climate change targets in this country. However, not willing to just focus on the negative, I also wanted to try and find, was there any examples out there of where farmers are actually doing a really good job of maintaining the social license? And by its nature, it's harder to find examples of this because it's a little bit more subtle to see where things are in a really good place. But I did find two examples out there. And the first is the burn in County, Ar in County Clare. And the burn is a very unique and sensitive ecosystem. It's the only place in the world where Arctic alpine flowers go right next to Mediterranean flowers. And to protect the ecology of the burn, farmers down there have come together with Chagask, local authorities, and local botanists on the burn to create a new measures-based scheme that's funded by the European Union. Botanists in the burn realize that livestock farmers and cattle actually have a key role to play because cattle keep the grass on the burn grazed down, which allows flowers to flourish in the spring and summer months. So how does it work? Well, as part of the scheme, farmers are paid on a per paddock basis, and the payment is linked to how well the individual farmer can clean out their paddocks at the end of the wintering season. The clean-out job is ranked by an independent assessor on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest score. The higher the score, the higher the payment per paddock that the farmer receives. So, for example, 
farmer might have 10 paddocks on their farm, and each paddock will be scored individually. And let's just say the farmer gets a 5 out of 10 for some of their paddocks this year. Next year, the farmer will be aiming to improve in those scores because they're trying to get a 7 or an 8 in those paddocks and achieve a higher payment. So this scheme not only benefits the ecology of the burn, it also incentivizes best farming practices because uh, the farmers want to achieve the highest payment they possibly can. And for me, this is a classic example of win-win. There's actually four wins here. There's a win for the farmer because it allows the farmer and the burn to remain production focused. There's a win for the environment and the ecology of the burn because what the farmer is doing is actually uh, improving uh, the chances of those flowers uh, uh, flowering every year. It's a win for the EU taxpayer because there's a clear return on investment uh, from, from uh, what the farmers are doing. And it's a win for the social license because the public good that those farmers are doing, that, or the, what the work that those farmers are doing in the burn is delivering a public good which reinforces, gives them a strong social license to operate and do what they do. And whether they know it or not, uh, the, progr burn, the pro burn program is a classic example of behavioral economics. And behavioral economics is a recently new uh, area of economics pioneered by Dr. Richard Taylor. Uh, he won the 2017 uh, Nobel Prize for Economics for his, his work in this area. And behavioral economics is better known as nudge theory because how it works is that it nudges large groups of people to do things that they've never done before, uh, like file their taxes on time or wear a seatbelt in a car. Uh, and so for example, in the, in the case of the burn, it nudged farmers to focus on best practice to, to, to help uh, uh, the flowers in the burn. The second example of where I see a strong social license uh, being maintained and enhanced in Ireland is in Doubt. Doubt is a farm that's also, again, in a really unique and sensitive area of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, it's part of the Bruna Banya, which is a world, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and Doubt Farm was uh, bought by uh, Devonish, uh, an animal nutrition company, in 2013. And uh, they installed a, a suckler beef farm uh, at Doubt. Uh, and when they bought the farm in 2013, they found it in actually quite a a uh, state of disrepair. And the team at Doubt is led by Dr. John, John Gilliland, who's a former uh, UFU president and also chair of the UK Rural uh, Climate Change Forum. And under Dr. Gilliland's uh, leadership, the team at Devonish set about a program uh, of measure and manage and measure again. So over the last four years, they've started to work slowly and slowly on in improving the soil health at Devonish, which this map here uh, illustrates. And as of February 2018, the average pH on the farm now is up to 6.1, which is the sweet spot where they want to have it. However, not happy to stand still, the team at, at Devonish have created a world first as well, and went a little bit further. And I want you to say hello to the world's first ever carbon balance sheet for a farm. And effectively how a carbon balance sheet for a farm works is, they calculate the amount of carbon emissions from the farm, and then also calculate the amount of carbon that the farm itself is sequestering and offset one against the other. So what Dr. Gilliland and his team at Devonish did, they started by calculating the amount of emissions from the suckler herd on the farm, and then they went and they dug 88 soil pits all across the farm to find out how much carbon was in the ground. The second thing they did then was they used a, light, a technology called LIDAR to measure and map how much uh, carbon was in the hedgerows and the trees all around the farm. And with that, they were then able to calculate how much carbon is sequestered by the farm every year. So in March 2018, they created this uh, balance sheet for the very first time, and they're able to show that of all the emissions from the suckler herd on the farm, Doubt is now sequestering 65% of those emissions. So the goal over the coming years at Doubt is to plant more trees, to grow more grass, uh, so that they can sequester more carbon. And the aim is to be the fir world's first carbon-neutral suckler beef farm. <clears throat> So what can we learn from everything I've just outlined there? How can Irish agriculture protect and even enhance its social license to operate? We know social license can break down from what I've seen in other countries, and we know the risks for Ireland. The increased output in primary production leads to greater environmental, greater animal welfare, and greater climate change risks to our social license to operate as farmers. So how do we proactively build and enhance our social license to operate? My vision of how we do this requires some new thinking. John Maloney, who was the former managing director of Glombia, once told me that the tr there's three ways to innovate. You can innovate the product, you can innovate the process, or you can innovate the business model. And I believe the best opportunity for Ireland lies in innovating our business model. And I don't mean in terms of what countries or what markets we send our food exports to. I mean in terms of how we re receive support from Europe. 
Historically, European payments were production-focused, as Europe sought to feed itself after the war. Over time, the EU has sought to align its support payments closer to environmental outcomes and away from production agriculture. This year, I've seen a lot of talk in Ireland about a €200 Euro per cow support payment for suckler farmers. However, payments like this are hard to defend because there's, uh, the return on uh, investment for a taxpayer is less obvious, and it's also difficult in terms of reaching our 2030 climate change uh, targets. What my vision for the future and how farmers can enhance their social license to operate with is with a new business model that combines the carbon balance sheet and measure and manage approach, approach in doubt with the nudge economics and tiered payment system of the Burns scheme. What I believe is that every Irish farm could create its own individual carbon balance sheet and the goal in each farm would be to strive for carbon neutrality, just like a doubt. And the closer to carbon neutrality the farm can get, the higher the payments received from Brussels will be. This would be a new results-based system that would incentivize the adoption of best farming practice, just like in the case of the burn. So how would farmers go about achieving carbon neutrality on the farm? Well, they'd take the exact same approach as in doubt. The scheme would nudge farmers to focus on improving their soil health. Only 12% of the soils in Ireland are at the correct P&H. It would nudge them to grow more grass. Only 3% of farmers in Ireland are routinely measuring grass and it would nudge them to maintain their farm hedgerows and plant more trees on their farm in a bid to sequester more carbon. The combination of improving soil health and growing more grass would also in turn make these farms more profitable. If this scheme was created, it would deliver the same win-win results we saw in the burn. It would be a win for the Irish farmer as it would allow them to remain production focused. Recent environmental schemes in Ireland have often sought to limit production. It would be a win for the environment and climate because the farmer payments would be linked to the improving soil fertility in this, in this island and also the environmental health of their farm. And it would be a win for the EU taxpayer who can see a clear return on their investment from paying farmers for this public good. And finally, it would be a win for the social license because Irish farmers will be able to show society the proactive approach they are taking to tackling climate change. My vision with this new measures-based scheme is for Irish agriculture to strive to be the world's first totally carbon-neutral farming sector, and then Irish agriculture can claim to be truly sustainable and be secure in the knowledge we have the full support of our society with a strong social license to operate. Thank you. <laughs>